But what I'm actually going to teach you is awareness. And I could see the guys, they'd pull, what do you mean awareness, man? I want, I want those big guns. <laughs> I said, and I would say, the big guns will come when you can feel what it is that you're doing with your body. This is part two of our deeply insightful interview with Kit Lachlan. Remember, if you haven't seen part one, go back and watch that. You can check it out on YouTube, iTunes, Android, Stitcher, or just the main website, propanefitness.com. Remember to subscribe for updates and let's get straight into the interview part two. I think if, if I wasn't as open-minded, I would have been very skeptical about and because I've experienced it on the workshop, I can definitely vouch that it's not a case of mechanically going through the stretches and just doing it for sets and reps because um, you could do it in two very different ways. But I imagine yeah. there are people listening that think, who's this hippie? I, I just want some, <laughs> I, I just want some prescriptions. Don't give me all this nonsense. And the I, there's not much I can say to them because it has to be experienced and it can't just you can't just write down on a bit of paper three sets of 30 seconds mm. and Bob's your uncle well that's what people do unfortunately and and that's the and so that becomes a, a new structuring myth people will say well that must work because that's that's the routine that person x prescribes and he's very flexible so but in let's say and it doesn't matter whether we're talking to a bodybuilder here I mean, bodybuilders, they all need to stretch biceps, for example. That's a good example. Um, and so you might recall what stretching your own biceps felt like. It was kind of a shock. Yeah. So so biceps, I mean, if we're talking about the kinds of things that we could say to each of those groups that they need to think about, at least at, on, we'd be on pretty safe grounds with bodybuilders suggesting that they need to stretch their biceps and perhaps brachialis and brachioradialis if they can't perfectly straighten their elbows for example and plenty of people can't do that if they've done a lot of strength training or actually you need a certain amount of hyperextension remember when i was demonstrating yeah you've got enough checking that. Remember, when I, remember when i was demonstrating i don't know whether i did this on this workshop but i'll go and do a handstand against a wall um, and then ask people to feel my triceps and they're actually quite soft because in this particular way of demonstrating this what i'm demonstrating there is that if you have enough hyperextension in the elbow you, the body's own structure will support the position, but if you don't, you'll have to exert tremendous amounts of force with your triceps in order to hold yourself in that position, and as a result, you won't be able to hold a handstand for very long. So, And the same with the knees. You need a certain amount of hyperextension in the knee, not much. You need enough to be able to stand up and support your own body's weight without muscular effort. And I remember I demonstrated that on the workshop too. I said, okay, well, I'm standing, right? Come over and feel the quads and hamstrings. They're relaxed. But if I bend my knee very slightly, then of course the muscles have to exert that force. No problem. Now, now you, let me get back to the question you ask and ask it again, please. What did we say? Oh yeah. So, so for the for the skeptic who is saying, ah, okay. why, why can't this just be? Yeah. Got it. Um, no amount of theoretical explanation or manipulation of concepts will even come within cooey of the experience of doing a stretch, and so you cannot convince a skeptic except by direct experience so if i have a and we have skeptics all the time in our workshops of course um i say okay get down and do this get into this position and then i'll say okay what do you feel now in the beginning there's just mass confusion what do you mean what do i feel well go a bit deeper into the stretch and they go a bit deeper into the stretch and then they get stopped by something i said what does that feel like okay now do this we'll exert a force a little force a little force for a beginner bigger force for someone who's more experienced. So the force is always in, in direct opposition to the movement that's required to get into the stretch. So if we were talking about stretching biceps, for example, we have the arm internally rotated. We move the arm back away from the shoulder like this. We can do it on, on the wall or on the floor. You might remember this. And so I can, and what does that feel like? So I can feel this incredible force through biceps and it's going down into my elbow. I said, yeah, okay. Now press the back of your wrist gently against the wall or the floor. Now, the only muscle you can use, or the primary muscle that you can use to press the back of your wrist, is long head of biceps in that position. So they press, 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 no movement. It's an isometric contraction, to be technical for a moment. Now you relax, and then you say, and this is the critical part, take a breath in, and in the period of breathing out, try to go a bit more deeply into that stretch. And the person, let's say they go an extra few degrees into the stretch. Then I'll say, now, move your awareness down to your tummy. Is your tummy soft? And of course it won't be soft. The body's experiencing terror. So I say, okay, let your tummy go completely soft. And the voluntary relaxation 
of the tension in the abdomen is the last step in the process. And the person always, and you saw this on the workshop a hundred times, the person who can relax when the body is being threatened is the person who can learn how to become flexible, even though the body's first response is to contract and say, nope, I'm not going there. So this is the, it, we're playing this edge the whole time. And you become expert at playing the edge. And when you become expert at playing the edge, you're flexible. So that's not something that I would have expected before doing it. I would have thought it was the case, the person who does the most volume in the specific position, you know, just like any other strength adaptation. Yep. So it's very, it's quite unnerving to think, actually, this is almost a, this is almost an emotional or a psychological pursuit, not a physical one. Stop there. Your emotions are physical properties of the body. There's a brilliant book called Descartes' Error. He's the, the name of the author will come to Damasio, his name is, Antonio Damasio. He's a neurophysiologist, and it was his genius to find that our emotions, or what we call our emotions, are exactly, nothing more and nothing less, than patterns of tension in the body. Now, that's not to say that each person's body who's displaying anger will be manifesting the same patterns of tension. That's not true. Your own pattern of anger, tension, will be unique to you. You have developed it over a lifetime. Your pattern of when you experience grief or sorrow or sadness or any of the other emotions, they are particular patterns and pop. Not just, not just patterns of tension in the internal organs, of the, although they are that. Let me give you a good example. When people are feeling anxious, this is a perfect example. Um, en endoscopy has shown that when someone is actually experiencing anxiety, their stomach muscles are literally fibrillating. The, the research has shown that. You feel anxious and your tummy is doing this. So the old folk idea of butterflies in the stomach turns out to be completely accurate description of that phenomenon huge and number of serotonin receptors in the gut exactly exactly and in fact your gut has over twice the neural innovation of the whole of the rest of your body most people don't know that that's absolutely accurate so there's more though these muscles here the scalenes are called accessory breathing muscles and you probably did some study on that in your in your anatomy and physiology because the scalenes lift the first rib and so when we're breathing anxiously or in a panic situation <laughs> that's how we breathe when this happens when the scalenes are lifting the first rib your brain experiences that as anxiety you see right. so so it's it's, it's inextricable talk, you talk, can't to, to say that this is an emotional or psychological um, phenomenon is to completely misunderstand the relationship between look I'll take a step back only our medicine divides the mind and the body Descartes was the first that's that's why the title is Descartes error that was Descartes fundamental error and it affects our medicine today we have we have the specialists who only work on the mind psychiatrists psychologists and so on we have specialists that only work on the body and the crazy thing is brain surgeons are paid more than feet surgeons Heart surgeons are paid less than brain surgeons. There's a hierarchy. Seriously, you you look this up. It's an, it's very very funny. I mean, everything's funny. But so getting back to what you were talking about, you cannot separate the mind and the body in this activity. And I would argue, even in pursuit of one rep max, you can't separate the mind and the body. Now, I have a very good friend of mine, John Valentine, who's actually a national standard weight lifter. He's one of our teachers too. He sometimes teaches with Olivia. When John and I trained in Olympic lifting together for a while, he was always much better than me. But when John was addressing the bar, I could predict with accuracy whether he's going to fail on the lift or not. We've, we've talked about this and he, we just laugh about it because his psychology now, his mental state, or I would argue his body state, he now doesn't have that thing in his head that was disabling him before. There was immense amount of self-doubt. There isn't now. There's less. And you, you, man, you just remember the last time you were watching a lifting competition. How often could you see, especially when someone's going for their second and third lifts, how often can you see when they're addressing the bar whether that lift's likely to be successful or not? How often? I, I'm, I'm not going to lie and say that I could, um, that I could tell, but I've certainly felt it um, with I think lifts off the floor, particularly where yep. if you're not confident you're going to do it, you just 
don't open the taps enough to overcome the inertia. If you don't think you can do it, you will not be able to do it. Full stop. And what, but the think, but it's more than the thinking. This is the thing. When you address the bar, you know, give it a little yank off the floor and just <clears throat> setting yourself up to exert yourself, it's the feeling in your hands that tells you whether you can make the lift or not. Do you get it? And the feeling in the hand, I mean, the proprioceptors are most numerous in the soles of the feet first and second most numerous in the palms of the hand for a damn good reason. Your whole experience and your belief in whether or not an experience is possible is all about proprioception. You can't separate them. So um, improving someone's grip is always the first port of call with a client that is struggling with their deadlift for me. So if I yeah. have someone that is doing that, I'll make them do single arm hangs, deadlift lockout holds um, to make themselves feel more secure. Well, you've heard me on single, single arm hangs. Yes, single arm hangs, are, and for an Olympic lifter, they're immensely important because single arm hangs in time will redress every problem in your shoulder. Any mobility problems you have in your shoulder, single arm hangs are the secret. Why? Because when you hang from one arm, pec minor is stretched, serratus anterior is stretched, and when you look at the joint from the side, it's perfectly aligned and you don't have to think about it. Gravity does it for you, baby, right? And, of course, at the same time, well, I, Craig and I worked up to five minutes two years ago, five minutes of single arm hanging. 30 seconds, change arms. No, foot, no feet touching the ground. 30 seconds, change arms by five minutes. And our grip strength improved. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> it's not easy. Um, if anyone's listening and hasn't tried single arm hangs, um, just just try it. Let us know how you get on. If you get more than 10, 15 seconds on your first attempt, then you're doing pretty well. <laughs> you are. You are. And look, on that too, um, I would recommend not even attempting single arm hangs until you can do five full minutes from two arms. I mean, it might sound a bit conservative, but, but five minutes goes... Like, well, five minutes is experience <laughs> faster than five minutes. We're talking relativity here. When you're hanging from two arms, five minutes will seem like a lifetime. But the thing is, once you've got, once you've got five minutes in your body, and look, being realistic here for a moment, three minutes would actually be enough, but I always tell my clients five minutes. It's just to motivate them. You know? Such and a long then, time. It, it is such a long time. So th let's, let's be say, okay, so we'll, we'll, re we'll rephrase that. Let's give them the goal of three minutes, but it's got to be a solid three minutes, not a desperation effort. You've got to be able to hold for three minutes. Then you can start introducing some 10-second one-arm hangs. And my strong recommendation is when you're doing this stuff, never go to your limit in the beginning. I'll explain why, and you, you know this already, but tendons and ligaments have about one-tenth the nutrient supply of muscles. The fastest thing in the body to adapt is the neural system, and the second fastest thing to adapt is the muscles, and a long way behind that are the tendons and ligaments. And so one of the reasons why bodybuilders in particular hurt themselves so often is they're not giving giving themselves, well, that's one thing I think the gymnasts are very good at doing is this idea of deload weeks. One week in four, um, you do... I don't remember if there's an actual formula for this, but, and you probably know this better than I do, but one week in four, you basically have a light week, what we would used to call a, a light week, where instead of, if let's say 140 is your best back squat at the moment, um, you don't actually let yourself squat more than 90 or 100, that sort of thing, even yeah, though you know that... I'm in deload weeks every, every four to six weeks, for example. Yes. If you do that, the the you're protecting your body from that kind of injury. Tendon and ligament injuries are really nasty little things too, as you probably know if you've ever had any. And I'm dealing with some elbow problem of my own at the moment, not quite sure what it's causing. Um, but normally they, they're slow to come on. I mean, unless it's an impact injury or, you know, you have an accident in the gym, they're normally slow to come on. They're like repetitive strain injury of a particular kind. And unfortunately, they're usually slow to leave you as well. So this is probably why you see when someone artificially changes the um, the the processes, um, you have a bodybuilder who starts a cycle of steroids and tears a pec because yes. their pec is is getting stronger at a faster rate than their connective tissue can account for. Well, it's actually getting stronger at a faster rate than the connective tissue. Full stop. That's all. That's all you need to say. That's what's right. happening. That's exactly what's happening. And so. What happens in those instances is the muscle actually tears itself apart. And so, the, look, we, the, one of the problems with our anatomy is that people are still thinking of muscles and bones 
as engines and levers. But this, in fact, the body is much better thought of as a fluid structure. And that's actually how cellular force is produced anyway. I mean, it's, not, it's, nothing, like, it's nothing like cranking on a ratchet, you know, to lift a crane. It's, it, that, that's not how it works. The body is working in compression and tension the whole time, as you know. It's a, what Buckminster Fuller called a, a tensegrity structure. When you actually see what happens in the body, when you actually do some measurements, I'll take a step sideways now. Robert Schleip I know very well, and he's, he's one of the two gurus of connective tissue at the moment, or fascia, as they call it. Thomas Myers is the other one. I know both of them, but I know Robert much more. What he said was when people are doing an exercise like, I think it was a, a single-leg Romanian deadlift from memory, he said EMG um, studies have shown that adjacent muscles are often experiencing more force than the muscles that are actually doing the work in that movement. And no understanding of anatomy from a, a levers, pulleys, crane, fulcrum understanding explains that at all. But they are the facts. Now, I find this absolutely fascinating. I'm not surprised by it, but I didn't know it until he told me. So this, again, is another reason, I think, to incorporate some stretching in your routine as a preventative to find out what actually needs work. If you do, there's only a few stretches you need to do. I would say there's probably half a dozen stretches that people need to do as a kind of a challenge for themselves to find out how the body's feeling or working or how it's actually better to say how it's absorbing the stress of your life, the whole of your life, is by basically feeling what it feels like. You have, to, And until you put your body in a particular position, you will not feel what it feels like because we, we, we push that awareness down below conscious awareness. That's why I made the, the, the comment about when was the last time you really felt the clothes on your body? And most people will say, well, actually, you've never felt the clothes on my body. I could drive feeling it now. Can you feel the clothes on your body? Yes. Oh, I realize my belt's actually a bit tight. Yes. Anyway, that's just awareness, right? But we, in the same way, we need to move our body through some fundamental or some primal movement patterns in order to feel whether or not there's a problem in our immediate future or medium distance future. That's what I use stretching for. So I think this is something that's quite difficult to grasp for someone who, who's pro, you know, you, all of your, your training is programmed out on a spreadsheet and you're dealing in fulcrums and force development. And you, and so to then say this is an exercise in awareness is, is, mm. uh, is interesting. And I, so what you said about doing the handstand and you have no unnecessary tension in the handstand, your triceps are relaxed, you're resting on your structures. Um, whereas, for example, with, with powerlifting, you're cued always to have as much tension as possible, even with the muscles that aren't the prime movers of a, of a lift. So, but, but let me interrupt you there, because sure. it would be completely improper to compare those two activities. Because if I'm actually doing a handstand, not just demonstrating how structure can be organized to support a particular shape in the body, I'll be pressing my hand, arms off my body as hard as I can. That's actually the activity itself. But then my friend Yuri, you know, Yuri Marmestein, the great handstand guru, he says, yeah, that's how you do it in the beginning, to strengthen the structures and to align the structures. But then, he said, you learn to relax the structures which don't need to be um, pressing so hard. It's just a, 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 and the reason for that is conservation of neural energy. Right, it's, exactly the same. it's exactly the same in the gym. The prescription to have everything tight, that's in the execution of the activity itself which will be at one rep maximum or very close to it. But you don't do all of your training like that. And so it's not, do you see what I'm getting at? There, there is things that we do that are designed to have training effects, which we can predict. And then there's how we actually do the thing itself. Now, some of those things will be the same, but some of them will not be the same. If I was teaching someone how to do a Romanian deadlift, for example, we might organize a chair to be in front of their shin so that they can't move their knees forward. And we might say, we might give them the mental picture, okay, now try and touch the wall behind you with your glutes, right? That's normally how you do it, a hip hinging thing, let's say. But it's a training exercise. Once the person has that awareness of how to use those muscles in the body, take the props away and they do the activity itself. So do you think every, every lifter who let's say someone who isn't interested in being flexible, but mm. is, is training in this way, at least for the, the higher intensities, is going full tension. Um, do you think they need to learn to consciously relax and to have the, the opposite end of that? To... Yes, De definitely. 
Uh, look, my best example, it's actually not so important in powerlifting, but sprinting is a perfect example of this. Um, there's a wonderful photograph of Ben Johnson winning that his particular event, and Carl Lewis was about six metres behind him. It was one of the biggest thrashings in the history of the 100-metre event. Ben is looking off to one side like this, his, his, and the camera was focused on him. So the, the, he was in razor-sharp focus, but all the muscles of his body relaxed. They're soft, and he had extremely low body fat. Carl Lewis behind him is straining, struggling to catch up. All the striations of his muscles are completely, clearly visible. One guy was relaxed, one guy wasn't relaxed. The relaxed guy was running faster. Charlie Francis, his coach, was so big on this. He claimed that it's the capacity to relax quickly that gives you your, or that's one major dimension in how quickly you can do your stride turnover thing. Most people's bodies are fighting themselves in an activity like sprinting, I mean. Not so much, or to some extent would have to be true in Olympic lifting too. If you can't actually make the fundamental shapes, um, then you'll have to compensate somewhere else. But in powerlifting largely, because I mentioned before, the actual range of movement requirements are so much less. And I'm not, I'm not in any way dismissing powerlifting. It is an awesome and just breathtaking thing to see and to do. And I did do powerlifting for a, a while, but I was hopeless at it, of course, with my proportion. But the thing is, I recognize how hard those those men and women are working and I have the utmost respect for them. But compared to an Olympic lifter, um, the actual technical range of movement requirement is less, that's all. Neither good nor bad, just a, f a feature of the activity itself. Um, Olympic lifter, on the other hand, someone who can't get the um, catch position and the snatch in the right position is constantly losing the bar forward, they're going to need to work on some specific things, that's all. But what I'm, when I talk about flexibility, I think all athletes need to acquire some flexibility because the research shows that if you have the capacity to relax more, unlike what some of the research has shown, you in the, in the, when you are actually exerting force for a particular purpose, your capacity to exert force is more, not less. So developing the greater... capacity to relax in a lot of people, completely untrained um, capacity, and especially if you're going to a desk job every day and you're, you're in tension and then your only training is developing tension. So you've got all of this. Um, I'm trying to avoid using the, the, the yin yang, but it's the only thing that comes to mind right now. So um, you have to have something to. The, the yin yang is, is perfectly appropriate for this. You, you're building up what you're doing. And this is something that we used to say in our gym. Um, we start with biomechanics, good biomechanics. Why? Because whilst it may be the case, and this is particularly true for men, because men are naturally stronger than women, normally, in the upper body anyway, if your biomechanics aren't sound and you're naturally strong, you will make progress in the early stages of your training, and it really doesn't matter what training regimen you're following. If you increase the load over time, you'll get stronger. Simple as that. But if you run into the limits of your biomechanics, then an injury is in your future. And so what we, when, when I used to have a, a group of complete beginners come into the monkey gym, I'd sit them all down and I'd ask them all what they wanted out of the, the next 14 weeks because we were working on a 14-week semester block. And then I said I'd listen to all the things. So some guys wanted to get more buff. Um, many women want to be able to do a single chin-up um, and so on and so forth. And I would say, well, they're all laudable goals, but what I'm actually going to teach you is awareness. And I could see the guy, they'd pull, what do you mean awareness, man? I want, I want those big guns. <laughs> I said, and I would say the big guns will come when you can feel what it is that you're doing with your body. And I demonstrate, I would say, look at this chin up and I'd jump up onto the bar and I'd say, this chin up uses just my arms. This chin up uses mostly my back muscles. Can you feel the difference? And of course, no one who's never actually done that exercise can feel that difference. I said, that's where we begin, because the chin-up is an excellent bicep-developing exercise, but it's also an excellent lat-developing exercise and other things as well. You then decide which of those goals you're going to pursue, not as a concept, but as a feeling. That's where we start. So the bodybuilder, in some ways, being able to selectively turn on and off certain muscles, especially if they're competitive and, mm -hmm. and can pose correctly, might be at an advantage to have that, um, that grounding in their body and knowing what when to or having the ability to selectively relax as well. The, the, the best posers can all do that. Frank Zane was a master poser. You're probably familiar with him. Incredibly graceful, flexible, beautiful, aesthetically beautiful. Um, 
and he had that capacity. I mean, something that, that all the top bodybuilders can do, they all do have excellent muscle control, and they definitely can target and contract individual muscles and then groups of muscles to, at, for an effect. You'll see when someone does a lat spread, for example, they'll stay relaxed for the last moment and they start spreading the lats and then they'll pull the shoulders down against the tension of the traps and everything just pops out. You can't do that without practicing it a thousand times. And that is awareness. And you're looking at yourself in the mirror when you practice those things and you're seeing what your feeling produces visually and you refine that. There's, there's In any activity at the top level, there's an immense amount of work being done in it. Uh, and that's why, and that's why we're all such fans of sport, isn't it? It's it's exciting and interesting. Intrinsically, it's interesting. It anyway, look, getting back, getting back to the main topic here. The the reason for pursuing flexibility, or some flexibility training, is basically so that you can improve your sleep. I didn't mention this before, but the majority of people these days, and particularly double AA, A, triple A personality types, A types, um, one of the things that they will talk to you about in a quiet moment is they actually don't sleep all that well. If you can improve the quality of your sleep, and then you are driving one side of the adaptation mechanism suite much, much more effectively. It's not just, I, mean, I had a friend who was a, who was a champion bodybuilder, and I was talking to him about overtraining one day. And he just looked at me and he said, kid, there's no such thing as overtraining. I said, fuck, what do you mean? He said, there is just inadequate nutrition or insufficient rest. And the light bulbs came on, of course, that must be right, right? And so people who are not getting sufficient rest, they, they will be overtrained. How do you know whether you're getting sufficient rest? Are you, over the period of a year, getting stronger slowly most of the time? If you are, that's evidence that you're sufficiently rested and your nutrition, nutrition must be adequate at least. So I'm maybe seeing where you're going with this, that you're saying that by being able to relax on cue there's some kind of systemic effect that you can then oh, improve absolutely sleep and the rest of it absolutely and so what that's why the the tagline on our on our site is simply um grace and ease in the body and more efficient movement now it doesn't sound like much of a goal does it except that when you talk to people you find that grace and ease in their body is about the most foreign concept they've ever heard of and you've seen me move and walk around and how I move. It's relaxed, right? It's easy. It looks graceful. And I'm old. I mean, chronologically, I'm old. I'm 60. I'll be 64 soon. It makes no difference whatsoever. I move much better now than when I was an athlete at 25. Way, 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 way better now. And so, and so let's talk specifically now to this group of people who are listening who are Olympic lifters, powerlifters, and bodybuilders. This is a tiny period in your life. The period as a competitive athlete, you might well let's let's some guys do manage to keep on powerlifting in particular and into their fifties, right? I think of Louis. What's his name? Louis Simmons. Is it Simmons or Sims? I can. Simmons. Yeah. There's the, the there's a few Louis sort Simmons. of very very old lifters as well. Really kind of outliers. Um, They're outliers. Yeah. They're out. And and I'm and I'm a big I'm, I would always recommend continuing your activity for as long as you can, but if you want to experience grace and ease in your body, then pursuing any of those activities as far as you can will not necessarily give you that. The capacity to be able to relax, the most important capacity to be able to digest your food and to be able to rest effectively. They're the two ends of those that overtraining thing that I was talking about a moment ago. That's actually where becoming relaxed and physically supple actually helps you. It's such an indirect thing, though. I mean, if I if I started my stretching workshops by saying, well, actually, the goal of our workshop is for you to sleep better um, and to be able to digest your food better, well, half the half the attendees would probably walk out. But actually, those two things are absolutely primal in your life. They are tremendously important, and many modern people don't have them, especially the office workers you're talking about, who We've got, we've got to acknowledge this. Most people experience their life as stressful these days. Our cat never experiences her life as stressful. That's the difference between us and cats. We want to experience a more cat-like state. The way to do that is to do the kind of suppleness exercises that they do and to not take things too seriously. 
and to be able to learn how to switch off. Switching off is relaxing and letting go. These are the greatest life skills you can have, in my opinion. And speaking now about people who work in the corporate environment, if you're capable of relaxing when the shit hits the fan, that will have a momentary evolutionary advantage for you, wouldn't you think? Absolutely. But no one prizes no one prizes that as a, as a worthwhile objective, but in fact, it's phenomenally worthwhile. So you're somebody who's developed this capacity, and I, I think you're the most appropriate person for this as well, because you've been a lifter and you've been, you said when you were 25, you were moving badly. You've been tight, tense. I, I was a middle, let, let me just, let me just, when I was a middle distance runner, um, I, we haven't spoken about this, but I ran competitively for years before I became an Olympic lifter. When I was a middle distance runner, Yusuf, I, my experience of daily life was pain, pain, and more pain. When my body was at rest, it was hurting me. When I was training, it was hurting me. I, 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 it was, it's a long story, and I wrote about it in one of my books, but I found I have a significant skeletal leg length difference. So my right leg is almost, you can't believe that I didn't notice this, and no one, no, no one else did either, but my right leg is about 18 millimeters shorter than my left leg. And in fact, that was part of my master's research, and I won't I won't bang on about this for too long. But in fact, about half the population have a measured difference of five millimeters or more in the cumulative length of their um, tibias and femurs. And there's a huge amount of research on this now. But because the original research has decided, without reference to any argument or evidence, that the only it was a, a, they would only judge a leg length difference as being a difference if it was ten mils or more, the, this huge group in the population who had differences between five and nine mils, which is about 35% of the population, they missed this group completely. And that's so most Kip of So has a, a book on back pain um, where he go, takes you through a self-diagnostic process to identify if you have any anatomical or functional leg length difference. And mm. I've been through that myself, and I, I do have a slight one as well. I don't know whether mm. it's... I, I think it's probably functional, but um, yeah, so I'm, I'm one of that 35%. Well, well, look, you can. This is something. Let's um, divert the conversation for a moment because this is important. Um, you can get someone else to look at the structure of your erector spiny muscles, and and you'll know straight away whether or not the difference in your leg is significant or not. When I was an Olympic lifter, you said this is absolutely true. The erector spiny muscle on my right hand side was twice as thick as the one on my left hand I'm, I'm side. Exactly they look the same. And any time I see a, a physio or anything, they always comment on it. Yeah. Well, the thing is, if you're not in back pain, that's an example of a successful adaptation. The muscle on the outside of the curve has to be stronger to support the activities you're doing. And if it's not hurting you, no problem. So that's another thing that physios, they just drive me up the wall. They'll look at something like that and say, oh, look, this is a problem. Erector spinae is, you know, twice the size on on this side of your body. And I would say at the time when I didn't have back problems, I had back problems in my middle back, actually not in my lower back. That's, a, that's another story. Um, so if you look at anyone's face, the ears are not the same height. The nose would be bent to the side. One eye is bigger than the other. There is no symmetry in the body. Now, only leg length symmetry has significance for someone who's a deadlifter or an Olympic lifter. Arm length, and I've seen tremendous arm length differences too, um, basically, if you're holding a bar overhead, it doesn't matter whether your arms are slightly different lengths. It doesn't matter. But leg length, that's a whole different ballgame because the stress is around the sacrum. The sacrum is where gravity's forces are resolved through, through our fundamentally um, unbalanced structure. Right? I mean, when someone's standing on their two legs, they're constantly moving, as I'm sure you're aware. There's no such thing as standing still. It's only only the scale of how you're looking at it, 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 it tells you whether this person is still or not. Even the Buckingham Palace guards are moving all the time, it's a small amount. Anyway, so what I mean by that and the significance of that is it's not like animals who can rest on four legs and actually let everything just go soft the way cows can or horses can or, or anything else. They literally can hang up their ligaments. We can't do that. We're balancing all the time. So if someone is involved in a, a weight-bearing sport and their structure is sufficiently asymmetric, then other structures will have to develop preferentially so that the, the function is balanced. Now, if you've got back pain, low back pain or middle back pain or neck pain and you're doing one of these activities, that's when sometimes a little lift from the heel of your lifting boots can help enormously to reduce that. And that's the only time you'd, you'd use a little heel lift when you're squatting or when you're deadlifting, 
if it's a problem. If you've got a structural asymmetry and it's not a problem, don't make it a problem. Do you see what I'm getting at? It, there's no, it, this is another example where it's not one size fits all in the thinking. You have to see, have to look at the individual and help them work out what it is their body needs. Some of those adaptations are perfectly successful, in which case, well, here, I'll give you another example. I sat in on a colloquium, um, which was a bunch of physios and doctors and, and uh, strength and conditioning coaches and so on, talking about Kathy Freeman. Kathy Freeman, the, um, she was a gold medalist in Sydney, 400 meter runner. And one physio stood up and said, oh, just look at that pelvic instability. We were looking at, at her running. He, he said, if I was working with her, um, we'd, we'd, we'd give her exercises and specific techniques to make that pelvis more stable. And I said to him, well, I said this publicly, I said, well, how can you be sure that that instability or what you're regarding as instability or a lot of movement in the pelvis how, how can we say that's not actually contributing to her world record capacity? You don't know that. You can't just see something that in most people would look like a problem in someone who's an elite athlete and label it as a problem because you're not actually dealing with the same bodies there. Any elite athlete, for example, has hugely efficient neural system compared to a non-athlete. So Stuart McGill talks about something similar where he, look, he says, if we look at the Eastern Europeans, they've got the highest incidence of hip dysplasia uh, globally, but this may actually be precisely why they produced so many good weightlifters. And it's you know, if we pathologize it, then we may be missing something in the greater context. Yeah. So we always assume that unless someone's in pain or that there's something they want to do and can't do, then there's nothing that needs fixing. But speaking most generally, the capacity to relax. Um, well, that's the big difference. Speaking about Eastern Europeans, when I, I knew Mel Sif very well. I don't know whether you're familiar with Mel Sif. Mel Sif wrote a book with a guy called George Verkovshansky. Many of your listeners will know him. He was a, a guru at the time. Oh, yeah, he, he wrote a book on powerlifting programming. Super yeah. He has written many, many books. He was a br brilliant guy, and I knew him very well. But I remember Mel standing up at a, at a fitness conference um, he was a keynote speaker at that conference, and he said, there's no such thing as dangerous exercises. Then he paused, and you could hear him go, <gasps> he said, there's only dangerous ways of doing exercises, and that is our position in a nutshell. So that's interesting. I remember you saying that you think people are overly mollycoddled, and I remember at the at the weekend seminar, you'd have somebody in a stretch and they'd say, Kit, Kit, it hurts when I, when I do, or I feel this when I do this. And you, you'd, you'd say, great, go and explore it. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound like something I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Rather well, than... look, the, the, word, the word you use and before is perfect. You, you use the word pathologize. We are in a culture now where someone, um, they tw feel something or they tweak something in the gym and the first thing they do is they run off to a doctor or a massage therapist or a physiotherapist asking for some kind of treatment for this thing. The best thing you can do if you tweak something, let's, let's use tweak in the broadest possible sense, and you might be talking about something that literally cripples you for a week, just wait. This thing that you're living in is not some weak, tragic structure whose evolutionary survival is, is, is threatened in, you know, with every breath in and out. It's nonsense. People think about their necks, for example, as being fundamentally fragile because so many practitioners tell them they're fragile. It's bullshit. All of the evolutionary mistakes have been weeded out thousands of generations ago, actually. The structure that we live in now, given the things that it needs, and which most people don't give it, the structure we live in now is actually the end result of many, many mistakes in the past. Let me give you an example of what I mean. The worst thing you can do for your body, or one of the worst things you can do for your body, is to sit at a desk all day. Now, where I'm sitting and talking to you now, this is actually my standing desk. I do all my video editing and all the rest of it at a standing desk. But I knew we'd be talking for a long time today, so I brought my high stool in, so I've been sitting on a high stool. But immobility, immobility is definitely damaging to the body. So that's one thing. The second, experiencing your life as stressful is immensely damaging to the body. And there's a huge literature on this. If you go into any medical library, you're, you're, you're in this field, you walk into a medical library and look at this at the following section, gastrointestinal disorders and stress. There are hundreds of books on this subject. But the penny hasn't dropped. 
you can't just give someone the talking cure. I can't just say, oh, Yusuf, you know, your life is wonderful right now and um, you're actually totally okay. You just need to give yourself some positive affirmations, brother. That's all you need. That is nonsense. Your body needs to experience what feeling completely relaxed feels like. Then you can recreate it. So we have a whole, we have, I don't know, 30 or 40 scripts on my site which people can download for nothing. Uh, relaxation scripts. I, as you know, I teach in a monastery in Malaysia every year. I teach in other places too. This is on the meditation side of things now. And one of my specialities is line meditation. For most of your athletes, for most of your audience, doing a 20 minutes lying meditation session where you just basically put the script on your iPhone, put the pieces in and just lie down and relax and follow the instructions, which basically are visualization or feeling things or, you know, there's lots of different things. Um, that is the most useful thing they could do for themselves on a daily basis. It normally takes at least a month to learn the, the habit of what feeling relaxed actually feels like. And then two things happen. One is that you become aware when you're tightening up, which currently you're unaware of. And the second thing is you, as you become aware of you, oh, I can just let that relax. Unless you've had the experience of things feeling relaxed, it doesn't matter how often you say to your client, relax those shoulders, relax those shoulders. It's not in their, it's not in their mobility. Repertoire, yeah. Repertoire, thank you, perfect word. So that, that's, um, that's actually been my next question, which is that we, we've got a population of people who are experiencing their lives as stressful and are mostly immobile, apart from maybe squat, bench, deadlift three, four times a week. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was going to ask, to, in terms of bringing this together, what is the practical recommendation? And you've, I suppose you've answered that. Starting now, let me, let me, let me, let me put it that in a very short, simple terms. In fact, we can cut out the whole of the previous hour and just put this to air. Um, the, the greatest bonus you can give your body, um, and I'm talking from now until the, the day your body ends the time on the planet, the greatest thing you can give it is the experience of direct relaxation. For all sorts of reasons. We can go into the biochemistry of it, we can go into the neurophysiology of it, we can go into the psychology of it. It's all the same stuff. But to experience a state of deep relaxation will give you more benefits than anything else you can do, especially if you experience your life as stressful and especially if you're working in an environment where you're immobile most of the time. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the, the stretching exercises are an adjunct to that. The capacity to relax is actually the primary goal. Stretching exercises merely give you a different way of experiencing that. And so at the end of leg day, if you're a bodybuilder, that's when you stretch your hamstrings and your adductors and your quads. At the end of arm and chest day, that's when you stretch biceps, pecs, forearms, hands, whatever. If you're a power lifter um, and, you're, and you've got a, a weekly cycle where one, one of those days is the heaviest of your training days, that's after that day you sit down. You stretch, see what your lower back feels like, feel, bring the leg across the body, feel what the glutes feel like, stand up and stretch your calf muscles, what do they feel like? Stand up and do that bicep picture, what does that feel like? Once a week. Way less than people say you need to do. Everyone says you need to do stretching exercises, you need to do five reps of 30 seconds, you need to do it, you know, every day. That's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. You do not need to do that. The relaxation exercises, on the other hand, that's what you should be doing, in my opinion, every day for at least a month. And there are 20 or 30 minutes. You can just lie down and, and just listen. That's all you have to do. But the two things together, the stretching exercises and the relaxation practice together, will transform you in three to six months. Not, not just change you, transform you. Your experience of being you will be different and always more beneficial. It's not suddenly that you're going to lose your structure and just, you know, decay and and you know discombobulate that will not happen you will simply be relaxed and happier in fact a guy that i worked with for a long period of time he said if i ever started a school it would be called the happy for absolutely no reason at all school and that is the result of doing all this work and also too the strengthening stuff plays into that because being happy it is it partly at least a recognition of your own capacities and you know feeling strong feels good right yeah well, but you have to be able to feel it. That's the point. So that's some fantastic 
very concrete recommendations there and probably a bit of a curveball in saying you don't have to do the stretching exercises as frequently as people often say. And I think yeah. a common fear that people have, and it's, um, again, nonsensical, but that if I stretch, I'll instantly become this limp fish and I'll lose my capacity to well, lift. You, and... you, know, you know where that idea came from? It's such a bullshit idea. As I said, Ben Johnson was completely relaxed and he was an awesome performer. Some researchers, and I'm not going to name the schools that they came from, but some researchers did this ludicrous thing. They actually stretched, I think it was, what was it? They stretched triceps and pecs, I think, super hard and then found that if they then went into a maximum bench press afterwards that they couldn't exert the same amount of force. Well, duh. <laughs> so acute that, reduction. That, of course you will have reduction in force production, but no one in the stretching world ever said that's how you should use stretching exercises. And so from that... From that research, which was very heavily publicized and pushed hard by all the people who hate stretching or think it's useless or a waste of time, they considered that to be evidence of why stretching is no good or not useful to you. But no one in the stretching world would ever stretch that way. Stretching done today is for some purpose or goal months into the future. So nothing to do with it. No one in our world, and we have plenty of very strong athletes in our groups as well, no one would think about doing hard stretching of any kind before any athletic endeavor, ever. Nonsense. Actually, the two things work in opposite directions. Stretching exercises you can think of as ramping the neural system down, and that's why stretching is experienced by most people, once they can do it, as a relaxing activity. People will say, oh, yeah, I like to do a bit of a stretch at the end of a workout. It just helps me relax and I feel good. That's exactly what's happening because stretching reduces resting muscle tonus. Before any athletic endeavor, you want to lift muscle tonus. How do you do that? Do things dynamically, quickly, powerfully, briefly. You see what I'm getting at? So to put those two things together and, and then to do a bit of research which shows that strong stretching reduces force production is just scientific bullshit of the worst kind. Setting up a straw man, I suppose, for to yeah, make this claim. So I, yeah. I interrupted you earlier, Kit, about you said there were there is two or three stretches that the average person should be doing. Um, this was in relation to the the office worker who's a who's a lifter. Um, yeah. and I know you've got a lot of free content on your websites um, and YouTube. Yeah, I do, and actually, I, I do. Um, the 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 thing that could be most helpful for anyone you don't need any special equipment for this, presuming you've got something you can lie back over. But at the end of every day, and this is a daily thing, it's it's not for stretching. It's actually to redress the effects of being in this position all day at an, at an office, you need to drape yourself backwards over something that opens up your chest and increases your thoracic extension. Exactly that. And the easiest what, uh, thing to use, well, I've got a bolster um, at home that I use for that, or I've got one of those little wooden things that I lie backwards over a backbender. But if you've got a couch that has a round flat end, just lie backwards over that and hang there for a minute or two. Breathe deeply into the top of your chest. Here we're using the, the breath to open up the rib cage, And over time, your T-spine will become more flexible in extension, which, of course, is what you want for all sorts of reasons. And what that does, it literally pulls out the effects of that day's work in front of the computer. So that's definitely something that everyone should do. Everyone needs to do some kind of um, floor hip flexor stretch for reasons I went to on our workshops in great detail. And that all those things are available free on our YouTube site as well. Passive back bending's available free. Hip flexor stretch is available free. I don't know that we've got the elephant walk on um, on YouTube. Anyway, the elephant walk is just we'll for the include videos to all of these in the show notes on the website as well. Thanks, thanks. But I'm not sure that we've got one to the elephant walk. But anyway, I'll just describe it. It's a piece of cake. Basically, it looks like a very badly done forward bend. You stand. You bend your knees deliberately, you walk your hands down your legs until you can get your hands as close to the floor as possible. You lay your whole trunk on your thighs and you use little leg straightening actions. Leg straight, feel a stretch, stop. Let the leg bend again. Little leg straightening action on the other side, feel it, stop. It is the most powerful hamstring stretch you'll ever do and eventually you'll be able to do a full standing pike. You only need to do that one exercise. And the beautiful thing about that movement is it stretches your lower back, it stretches your glutes. Everything on the posterior chain is given a bit of work. But there's no stress in the body because the knees are bent and your hamstrings won't be screaming at you. Most people's hamstrings drop from doing a proper pike. 
with your knees bent, the pelvis rotates and all the things on the posterior chain can be given a stretch. As you straighten the knees, you will find your back will bend a bit more because you won't have flexible enough hamstrings to do the movement. Everything gets a stretch in the process. So this is all stuff really that nice we, to... we didn't get round to discussing, which is the kind of the the the, gra- the, 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 the granular detail in stretching and how mm. when a limb is supported, it, you can overcome the apprehension reflex and um, yes. there's a, yes. a lot of this stuff is is described in your videos as well on on youtube if 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 your audience is interested um in this stuff and wants more of that kind of technical stuff maybe you could set up something where um people could actually write questions to you and we could and we could just you could read the questions out um i don't know whether you do that kind of thing or not but i did an ama once on reddit that was that was, had quite an impact pretty popular yeah well, guys, um, yeah, post any comments, any any questions that you have for Kit, and we'd uh, would love to have him on again if uh, if you wouldn't mind, Kit. Um, uh, it's a pleasure. It's been absolutely fantastic talking to you. I, I don't want to keep you much longer. Um, as you can see, it's it's quite quite dark where I am and quite light where he is. So uh, <laughs> Kit is in Australia, and we managed to successfully meet up despite daylight savings yesterday, which requires a PhD in maths to to it align does. the timing. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. Excellent. Now, Yusuf, it's a, it is a real pleasure um, to talk with you, and, and I, I'm, I know that we're going to be doing some work together, actually together, together in the future. I know that will happen. Um, I guess the, the last remark I would like to make is stretching. Look, flexibility in and of itself is neither a good thing nor a bad thing. I know people who consider themselves flexibility experts will always extol the virtues of becoming more flexible. But this is not the case, at least the way I look at it. You need enough relaxed flexibility for for your daily life activities, and that's the range of movement part of it taken care of. So, again, getting back to Olympic lifting, if you can overhead squat, and by that I mean for those of you that are not familiar with the movement, you've lifted the bar up, you press it up or, or snatched it and caught it, and you've got bar at arm's length like this overhead. If you can squat down with your feet flat on the floor, and squat back up again, you have enough flexibility for Olympic lifting. As it turns out, though, you sort of correct me if I'm wrong, the overhead squat is not quite as simple as what people think. When they when they see it being done well, it just looks effortless, right? Nothing. Anyway, but it's a very, a very sophisticated and it's also a great diagnostic technique as well. But then, once you've got those range of movement requirements under control, and they are relatively easy to overcome any limitations you have, doesn't matter which sport we're talking about now, then consider stretching exercises from this much more subtle perspective, which is about improving the quality of your life, increasing connection to your physical structure, being able to relax and release any unnecessary tension, and a greater and a much deeper sense of internal peacefulness or happiness will manifest all by itself. And to that end, we recommend doing the daily relaxation um, script exercises for at least a month or three months if you're really serious they say in in the spiritual world they say if you want to make a change consider changing over a period of a lunar month but if you're really serious about making a change make a change over three lunar months and what they say is that you will actually be a different person by then and to and they'll everyone will still recognize you as you don't worry you're not going to suddenly you know grow an extra ear or something but you will feel completely different and you'll be more at peace with yourself and I, i think that's a that's something useful so that's a huge return on investment much more than uh, than people bargain for when embarking on a, a stretching program so yeah. i'm certainly fully sold on it and hopefully after hearing that you have been as well um so Kit, okay, how can well, we find out more you. about you as well um how can we find your videos and oh. and blog no, that's e- that's easy just go to my site stretchtherapy.net everything is there all the links we also have those forums too remember we, have, we run free forums. Um, anyone can become a member. You just need a, um, an email address. But the thing is, there are some very, very keen Olympic lifters there too, if that's your thing. And there's very keen power lifters as well. We've got a bunch of CrossFit um, guys and girls as well. There's a, there is a mixture over there. You won't find it too many other forums. And also the, 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 the conversation over there is polite. It's not strident. It's not, with all respect to Reddit, it's nothing like Reddit. It's, it's, no, it's nothing like... Um, I can't think of any other forum, but it, it's polite. It's a great I mean, atmosphere, it's, it's, a huge hub of wisdom as well. And as you said, athletes from different backgrounds that have really got a good grounding yeah. in this stuff. 
And also there are just links to hundreds of free things there as well. For example, all of our YouTube clips will be mentioned in some post or other. Or you could just go to my, if you if you go to YouTube and then just search on Kit Lachlan, I think there's 100 and, 110, I don't know how many there are. I haven't looked at it for a while. But we the thing is, even though we have a pay download um, channel, which is our Vimeo channel, the Mastery Series, for example, which I think is how we met each other in the beginning, wasn't it? Master the Pancake, Master the Pike, Master the Fullback Band. I can't remember exactly how we, we first met. But let, let me just finish the yeah. thought. Um, we have our pay, we have pay download programs, but they're sp very specific, very specifically oriented. So, for example, if someone does want to master the pancake, that's a, an exercise where you put your legs apart, hold onto your feet, and put your chest and tummy on the ground with a straight back. You know, it's a it's a high level of flexibility, not for a dancer, it's a warm up for a dancer. But as I said before, but if you want something as specific as that, that program, which I think cost fifteen bucks from memory, fifteen Australian dollars, and they're not worth very much. Um, or, or it might be American, I can't remember. Anyway, the point is a huge amount of free material on YouTube. The forums themselves are free and there's a massive amount of content there. I don't know how many um, tens of thousands of pages there are now, but there's a lot. Um, and the relaxation scripts are also, they're available free. We don't sell those. It's part of my give back to all the training and all the, the incredible help I've been given by the teachers that I work with. Um, so we've got 30 or 35 scripts there, I think. Um, relaxation scripts and we will be making more we have specific programs uh, follow along programs for people with back problems for example some of the lifters might find that very useful so there are yeah there's there's lifetimes of, of free content that you can really get your teeth into without without having to you know you can you can test that out first we've had a few clients buy your overcoming back pain uh, series of, of videos and they've had great success overcoming sciatica um, mm. so yeah, there's uh, there's more kind of focused video courses as well that you can buy on Vimeo. Well, look, we I don't know whether you've noticed or you probably have noticed this, but our programs are very inexpensive compared to most other programs. And my reasons for this, About I just like to talk about that. And the reason I, I want to talk about this because it actually will um, be the last thought I'd like to leave your listeners or watchers with, and that is, for all of us, our life is very short. It's going to be over quicker than we want. Um, and I apply the 50-year test to everything. Every decision I have to make, the first question I ask myself, well, who will care in 50 years? And nothing that I've ever been having to make a decision about has ever passed that test. No one will care in 50 years. So in which case, we have to fall back on another um, decision criteria set. And the one that I've chosen is, what decision can I make will provide the greatest good for the greatest number of people? And that's, that guides both Olivia and myself in all the work that we do. And so we didn't want, we could have probably made, because we our stuff was quite popular there for a while, we probably could have made a lot more money had we set the program the same price that everyone else sets their programs Absolutely. at, which is 50 pounds or 75 pounds or whatever. But... When, when Olivia and I were talking about this, I just said, no, absolutely not. We're going to make these programs as cheaply as possible or cheaply available as possible but while still being able to pay the bills and, and all the rest of it. And the reason is that there are plenty of people out there who don't have much money. And why should they be disadvantaged just because we happen to be living in a capitalist system, you know, where people are taking chunks from you at every every second, it seems like, sometimes. So... And also we have an explicitly open learning system and I've written, I have a blog as well where I go into some of these things a bit more philosophically. Um, but if you, the reason we don't have, and we don't have any copyright protection on our material either, we make it available cheaply, you can download it and put it on any of your devices so there's no DRMs on it. And the reason is, as I wrote on one of my blogs, the genie is already out of the bottle. The internet has made everything available. And so there's no such thing as protecting your work these days. So once we realized that that was simply not a, not a possible thing to do, we turned it around and did it the other way. We're practically giving away our work because we just want the information out there being useful to people in their daily lives. That's all. That's that's my wish. And th and that's why we don't use copy protection. That's why we have inexpensive programs. But they're, they're all done professionally at, as at a professional standard. I'm reasonably pleased with them such a great attitude and as a result you've offered a huge amount of value to people and um i'd imagine changed a lot of people's bodies and, and minds as a result 
Great. So, Kit, it's been a pleasure talking to you. As always, for anyone listening, if you want to catch any of the references, any of the videos or or books or anything that we've referred to over this conversation, you can check it out on propanefitness.com. You can look at show notes and our free ebook, um, Five Tips to Maximize My Fitness Pal, on there as well. Okay, Kit, thank you very much. I'll speak to you guys next week. Thank you, Yusuf.